Hello and a very warm welcome to Sunset TV's weekly news roundup, The World Panorama, where we take an in-depth look at major happenings across the globe during the week. From geopolitics, Russia-Ukraine war, environment, business, sports or entertainment. I'm your host Pavna Nair. Let us begin with the big stories. New Chinese Foreign Minister warns of potential conflict with United States, says relations have left a rational path. Russia-Ukraine conflict enters a new phase. Barrage of Russian missiles snap power links across Ukraine. Concern over fate of Zaporizhia nuclear plant. Mystery poisonings of Iranian schoolgirls continue. Iran's supreme leader calls it unforgivable crime punishable by death. One hundred and ninety three UN member states sign historic deal to protect world's oceans. Experts call it victory for global efforts to counter destructive trends facing ocean health. And the digital human is here. It listens to questions and delivers logical answers. Meet the next generation of chatbots. News in detail now. China's new foreign minister warns of potential conflict with the United States this week, saying containment and suppression will not make America great. His comments are the latest after the spy balloon saga heightened tensions between the superpowers. Let's take a look at this report. Relations with the United States have left a rational path, warned China's new foreign minister, Jin Gang, on Tuesday. He was speaking at his first press conference after becoming foreign minister. Chin warned of conflict if the United States does not hit the brake. His remarks followed a day after Chinese President Xi Jinping's direct rebuke of the United States on Monday. They came in the backdrop of the United States shooting down Chinese surveillance balloon last month flying over the United States. Chin reiterated his government's position that the unmanned vehicle was subject to forces beyond Beijing's control. He added that the United States was wrong in acting with the presumption of guilt. Tensions in recent years between the United States and China have often been accompanied with tariffs and sanctions. If the Trump administration imposed duties on complaints of unequal access to China's market, the Biden administration has restricted American businesses from working with Chinese partners on high-end semiconductors. Escalating matters, the United States sent high-level delegations to Taiwan since late last year to further upset Beijing. Chen said the question of Taiwan is the first red line of U.S.-China relations that must not be crossed. Beijing considers the democratically self-ruled island part of its territory. Chin, who was until recently China's ambassador to the United States, said the Ukraine crisis has reached a critical juncture. Chin defended Beijing's relation with Moscow, denying that they are a threat to any country. Named China's foreign minister in December 2022, 56-year-old Chin is one of the youngest appointees to the post. Bureau Report, Sunset TV. And let us now take a look at some other major global political developments this week. Ram Chandra Podel of Nepali Congress was elected the new president of Nepal. Podel, a common candidate of the eight-party alliance that included Nepali Congress and Prachanda-led CPN Maoist Center, received the vote of 214 lawmakers of parliament and 352 provincial assembly members. EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen urged a quick agreement on the future of the internal combustion engine after 2035. The European Union is planning to effectively ban the sale of new cars with combustion engines to cut planet warming emissions by 55% by 2030 from 1990 levels. Moving on, fist fights broke out among Georgian lawmakers as a parliamentary committee debated a bill on foreign agents that critics say is modelled on draconian legislation in neighbouring Russia. Video from inside the parliament building in the capital, Tbilisi, showed a brief about violent brawl between lawmakers after the chairman of the chamber's legal affairs committee appeared to strike the leader of the United National Movement opposition party that opposes the bill. 
Kolkata's Emir said on Sunday he was puzzled by the delay in delivering aid to victims of last month's earthquake in Syria, adding that it was wrong to abuse humanitarian aid to political purposes in an apparent swipe at the Syrian government. Amir Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani was speaking at the opening of the United Nations Least Developed Countries Conference in Qatar. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau will appoint an independent special rapporteur to investigate alleged Chinese interference in Canadian elections, he said. Canadian media have recently published detailed reports citing anonymous intelligence sources alleging schemes run by China to interfere in Canada's elections in 2021 and 2019. The rapporteur will be an eminent Canadian. Moving on, negotiators from over 100 countries completed a UN treaty to protect the high seas on Saturday. Environmental groups say it will help reverse marine biodiversity losses and ensure sustainable development. Here's the report. The ship has reached the shore. After 19 years of negotiations, 193 member states of the United Nations signed a historic agreement to protect and benefit from the world's oceans. The High Sea Treaty Agreement was reached on Saturday at the United Nations in New York City after negotiations first began in 2004. Yet to be ratified, the landmark treaty aims to put 30% of the world's ocean area into protected areas. The High Seas Treaty replaces the UN Ocean Treaty, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, signed in 1982. It established the high seas or the international waters that are open to fishing, shipping and research by all nations. The world's population that was 4.4 billion in 1980 is 8 billion today, which is why the agreement sets new fishing limits and routes for fishing lanes as well as new rules for deep sea mining. The world's oceans cover 70% of the Earth's planet's surface. They provide half our oxygen contain 95% of global wildlife. But since no one controls the high seas, its riches were only reserved for the first movers. With almost 90% of global trade being conducted on sea routes, the agreement is a victory for global efforts to counter the destructive trends facing ocean health for generations to come. Bureau Report, Sunset TV. The Supreme Leader of Iran this week called the poisoning of Iranian schoolgirls in recent months an unforgivable crime that he said was punishable by a death. A spate of mild poison attacks since November have left hundreds of girls' students hospitalized, according to state media. Over 1,000 girls have fallen ill after being poisoned in Iran since November. Iran's Supreme Leader has called them an unforgivable crime that should be punished by deaths if deliberate. Many in the country blame religious groups opposed to girls' education for the incidents. The poisonings come after months of protests since the death of a young woman, Masha Amini, who died in police custody on the charges of flouting hijab rules. For the first time since the Islamic Revolution in 1979, schoolgirls have been joining the protests that spiraled after the incident. Activists have accused the establishment of orchestrating the poisonings in revenge. There are also suggestions that some of the cases may be evidence of a mass phenomenon originating in mental or emotional stress. The poisoning started in November in the holy Shiite Muslim city of Qom. They quickly spread to 25 of Iran's 31 provinces prompting parents to take children out of school and protest. The U.S. has called for an independent investigation to determine if the poisonings were related to protests. If true, it would pave way for the United Nations to send a fact-finding mission to Iran. In 2014, people took to the streets in the city of Isfahan after a wave of acid attacks appeared to be aimed at terrorizing women who violated the strict Islamic dress code. Bureau Report, Sunset TV. In business stories this week, we look at
China set a modest target for economic growth of around 5% this year as it kicked off the annual session of its National People's Congress. China's gross domestic product grew by just 3% last year, one of its worst showings in decades after three years of COVID-19 restrictions, crisis in its vast property sector, a crackdown on private enterprise and weakening demand for Chinese exports. Garbage collectors, utility workers and train drivers walked off their jobs across France this week to show their anger at a bill raising the retirement age to 64. Unions call it as a threat to the French social model. More than 250 protests were held in Paris and other parts of the country. Organizers said it was their biggest show of force yet against President Macron's showcase legislation. A Czech company, Inflatech, is producing 30 different inflatable military decoys ranging from tanks and armored vehicles to aircraft and howitzers. Inflatech chief executive won't say if his decoys are used by Ukrainian forces battling Russian invaders, but he said his business was up by over 30% last year. Infratech expects growth to keep rising in double figures for at least another three to five years. Chicago is getting on on the electric bus bandwagon for greener transportation. Chicago Transit Authority wants buses that don't pollute the air while driving, yet can run reliably, even when cold weather cuts into battery range. It is, however, a costly move. Each electric bus costs about $1.1 million, or about $5 lakh more than a diesel model. But in the long run, the cost incurred would be $2.01 per mile to run the electric buses as against $3.08 for diesel. Officials of top intelligence agency in the U.S. answered Senate committee questions on Wednesday about global threats. One of the main focus for senators was the ever-evolving technology around the world and was the U.S. able to keep up with the national security threat it poses. The United States has been ratcheting up national security concerns about TikTok, mandating that all federal employees delete the Chinese-owned social media app from government-issued mobile phones. Slipping into a very short break here in World Panorama here. There'll be more news coming up just after this break. Do stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back after the break. You're watching World Panorama and moving on. Russia and Ukraine entered the next phase of the war this week with Russia unleashing a barrage of missiles across Ukraine, including the capital Kiev. The Black Sea port of Odessa and Kharkiv. The attack snapped power links at the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. Russia called the attacks retaliation for a border incursion last week that Ukraine is denying. Here are more details in this report. A massive retaliatory strike on Ukrainian infrastructure marked the latest turn of events in the Russia-Ukraine conflict on Thursday. The missile attack across Ukraine cut off power links at the Zaporizhia plant, Europe's largest nuclear plant. The attacks killed nine people in the cities from Kharkiv in the north to Orissa in the south and Zetomer in the west. It marked the biggest day of Russian missile strikes since the end of January, where 11 people were killed in the strikes in several Ukrainian regions. The Zaporizhia plant was taken over by Russia a year ago. Since then, the facility has operated on diesel generators for at least six times. The latest attacks marks the IAEA's failure to enforce a demilitarized zone near the facility. Experts say they also revealed the determination of Kremlin in search of a victory. It is nowhere as fiercely evident as the battle of Russian troops to control Bakhmut. Russia has lost thousands of troops in the battle for Bakhmut since last summer. Western experts say the town has little strategic significance, but a victory would mark a political success and potentially allow Russia to threaten larger Ukrainian cities. 
ब्यूरो रिपोर्ट सनसेट टीवी and let's now turn to news on science environment and climate parts of australia's east including sydney recorded their hottest day in over 2 years on monday with temperatures hitting 40 degrees celsius some inland towns reached nearly 41 degrees total fire bans were in place for multiple regions across new south wales while many public schools were closed due to severe heat australian officials warned of rising risks of bushfires in the east Tokyo based firm Biomess Resin is bringing new hope to residents in Naime Fukushima whose rice fields became unfit after nuclear reactor meltdown covered them with radiation over a decade ago. The firm is producing pellets from this rice that is used in low carbon plastic cutlery and takeout containers for chain restaurants. Experts say the use of this rice cuts down the use of petroleum products and also reduces overall atmospheric carbon dioxide. Volunteers Coast Guards launched a effort to clean up oil spill in Philippines. The empty Princess Empress was carrying 8 lakh liters of industrial fuel oil when it sank off the coast of the Oriental Mindoro province last week. That oil has now reached the shores of several nearby fishing villages, coating beaches in black sludge. Entrepreneurs are working to recycle e-waste in Kenya that is struggling with 51,000 metric tons of electronic waste each year. Only 17% of the waste is recycled. New companies are refurbishing damaged laptops and training the younger generations to recycle electronic waste. Youth delegates from 46 least developed countries attended the 5th UN conference in Doha, Qatar this week. LDCs consistently rank food, water, ecosystems and infrastructure as the most vulnerable systems to climate change hazards. The Doha program of action provides important areas for complementary action on the SDGs, Sendai framework and disaster risk reduction decisions under the UNFCCC and environmental agreements and bodies. and time to see what's more there in our globe trotting segment masterpieces by spanish painters diego velazquez francisco goya bartolome esteban murillo and grises dominique theotocopoulos most widely known as el greco will be seen in spain for the first time in 100 years the prado museum reached an agreement with new york based the frick collection that is undergoing renovation in New York. Nine artworks from Spanish painters will be displayed at the Prado along with five other related works. Former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson reportedly nominated his father Stanley for a knighthood in the list of honors he can grant as an outgoing leader, drawing accusations of cronyism. It was not clear what service Stanley Johnson's nomination was for. Johnson's father is a former European Parliament member and an author and television personality. He acquired French nationality last year. Making an unannounced trip to Iraq on Tuesday, nearly 20 years after the US-led invasion that toppled Saddam Hussein, US Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said Washington was committed to keeping its military presence in the country. The 2003 invasion led to the deaths of thousands of Iraqis and created instability that eventually paved the way for the rise of Islamic State militants after the US withdrew its forces in 2011. UNESCO's Director General Audrey Azoulay visited Baghdad, Mosul and Erbil in Iraq. Speaking from the Iraq Museum in Baghdad, Azoulay said it represented the historical depth of civilization in this country from the Sumerian to the Akkadian to the Babylonian to the Assyrian. Like countless other archaeological and cultural heritage sites in Iraq, the museum suffered from the country's decades of conflict. Looted after the 2003 US-led invasion of Iraq, the museum recently reopened to the public. Barbie celebrated International Women's Day on Wednesday by releasing a doll in the likeness of black female space scientist Dr. Maggie Edwin Pocock. 
Edrin Pokok was reportedly added to the Barbie UK role model series for her work in promoting STEM careers to girls. The British space scientist and educator said people often reacted with surprise that a black female could have such a career. And news now from the field of technology. Artificial intelligence chatbots have taken the tech world by storm. OpenAI's chat GPT is producing more realistic conversations than ever before. At the MWC trade show in Barcelona last week, established companies and startups showed a glimpse into the new generations of these chatbots. Here are more details in this next report. Hi, David. How are you today? I'm Jess, your AI digital assistant. What can I help you with? Hey, the game is all grainy. What's wrong with my TV? I checked and your internet connection is in order. The reason for the poor quality has to do with your subscription. DID's new digital human is a friendly face. It listens to questions and delivers logical answers. It is the next generation of chatbots. The Israeli startup's online avatar is a new interface that uses AI-generated text to carry out a flowing conversation. Hi, I'm Jacob. How can I help you today? Sure. You can find the item in aisle 42, section C, or if you prefer, I can have it delivered straight to your address. Creating a more real experience is also top of the agenda for French company Talker.ai. They have no online avatars, but their chatbot can even call customers who can speak to it. Bots are even moving off the web and onto apps. Infobip is a multi-billion dollar company that uses its communications API platform to help businesses interact with customers. And then there is OpenAI's ChatGPT that generates readable text and holds conversations based on what they have learned from a database of digital books, online writings and other media. It does not, however, always go to plan. Microsoft's new search engine chatbot has reportedly been belligerent and even insulting to users. As chatbots get increasingly realistic, the question is how long will it be before we cannot tell humans from machines? Bureau Report, Sunset TV. And with that, it's a wrap in World Panorama. We'll be back next week, same time. Till then, keep watching Sunset TV for more news and informative programs. Thank you for watching. Namaskar.